we are going to cover fingerprint comparison, or as many refer to it, friction ridge identification. Uh, we will address how friction skin is compared and identified. The methodology will be covered in detail so that we'll have a thorough understanding of the process. We'll also focus on the examiner's, examiner's possible conclusions and the fact that opposing conclusions are unacceptable. Since fingerprints are permanent and unique, they are ideal for personal identification. In law enforcement, fingerprints are used for identification in two critical areas. The first is in criminal record identification, where fingerprints are used to establish the identity of those arrested, deceased, or missing. Recorded fingerprints are also used to check the criminal history of individuals requiring background investigations for security clearances or employment. The second area of law enforcement where fingerprints are used is in the investigation of crimes through evidence prints found at crime scenes. That's what we're focusing on. Since all areas of friction skin are unique, when identification is made, it is 100% conclusive. This is why friction skin identification is looked upon as one of the strongest forms of identification. Friction skin is individualized through a comparison process of the ridge features, their appearance, and their unique arrangements. Now, every friction ridge is a unique formation. One of the complexities of the identification process is the various levels of clarity that may be present in the prints that are being compared. The level of clarity will affect the type of detail being compared and the amount of detail needed to make an identification. This is why a standardized answer as to how much detail is needed to make an identification is impossible to give. Every comparison is unique uh, and it's as unique as the friction skin is unique. Examiner understanding of variations in appearances among prints is needed before examination of a print takes place. Each independent print from the source will vary in appearance from every other independent print from the same source. Many factors influence the variations in appearances of prints. For example, the surface areas of the friction ridge skin that touch substrates influence the variations in appearances. The exact surface area of the skin touching the first substrate will not be the exact surface area of the skin that touches the second substrate. Each time the skin touches a substrate, the surface is going to vary. Also, the manner in which friction ridge skin touches a substrate influences the variations in appearance. Flat touching, rolling, sliding, or twisting will influence the skin's pliability, causing distortions. Studying the manners of touching and distortion will aid the examiner in examination of prints. And often when you are getting your training, you will be experimenting with touching surfaces at different, in different manners and seeing the results and understanding that. Also, as far as variations in appearances, the substrates or surfaces being touched influence the variations in appearance. The cleanliness, the texture, the contour, or the porous nature of the substrate, substrate is the surface that we're touching or that the suspect's touching, will influence the prints. It's one of the biggest factors uh, of many. The residues on the friction skin, when the skin touches a substrate, influence the variations in appearance. Sweat, oil, and blood are common residues that cause variations. Um, oils, dust, blood, or other residues are common residues on substrates. The types and amounts of residues and their interactions will influence variations 
with each touching of the substrate. The actual transfer of residues between skin and substrate will vary because each independent touching has different influences that cause variations. It would be nice if it was super simple and you just touch something and you leave a print behind, but there's so many factors involved. Also variations in temperature, humidity, or weather before, during, and after the independent touching of substrates will influence the residues on the substrate. And these variations also influence the transfers of residues between skin and substrate. As skin is traumatized with imperfections and regenerates, variations in the skin can occur. Uh, the healing process occurs over time. So, and, and then there's aging. So there are so many factors that will affect um, our result. Will we get a good result? Will it be something more challenging? And we need to understand these things as we are working. And sometimes we even have to testify about these things when we're asked a question like, well, why didn't you find some sort? Why was the result like this? Why was the quality this way? So we may have to do a little education for the jury. Uh, also variations in different latent print processing or de development techniques and variations in the application of these techniques will influence variations in appearances of an unknown or latent print. So heavy or light powdering, uh, did you add too much powder, not enough powder? Uh, Cyanoacrylate fuming, which is super glue fuming, chemical processing or fluorescent processing can cause variations in appearance. The same is true for variations in different standard print capturing techniques. The variations uh, in the and variations in the application of these techniques. So uh, the co components and the amounts of inks, chemicals, powders, substrates or electronics used to capture, record, or print uh, known or standard prints, that influences variations as well in the appearance. Uh, one more, the handling, uh, packaging, or storing of an undeveloped or non-fixed print can further influence its appearance. What do we mean about this? Non-fixed, of course, that means the print is just on a surface and we've done nothing with it and nothing to protect it. Now you can protect things uh, by how you package them. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. But as far as a fixed print, if you are going to fix a print before you move it, let's say you wanna transfer something to the lab for further processing, the only way to really do that effectively is to glue fume. So, and glue fuming, as we're going to learn um, coming up here pretty soon, that works with non-porous surfaces like glass and plastic, um, painted wood that is, you know, has a good finish to it. It has to be a non-porous surface. Um, that will fix a print. So if we do that in the field, then it's less likely we're gonna damage the print, getting it back to the station for further analysis. Uh, now, of course, what we typically will do is just dust and lift and we're, that's it. But if you actually wanna take the object back to the station, then the, the, the material itself, the, the, the dusted print or, or just the non-dusted print, uh, it can evaporate, it can rub off, it can get scratched, it can transfer to the package. It could even blend more into the substrate, depending on what the background is like. Substrate, uh, surface contact, environment, temperature, humidity, and light can all influence the appearance of a captured print, uh, just as they can with a latent print. So we need to be aware of this. Now you can Let's say I, I find a drinking glass and I wanna take it to the station to dust for prints there, or maybe to do the super gluing there because I have better results there. 
I have a nice, you know, work surface. I've got all of my different powders and I've got a glue fuming chamber. I've got my ultraviolet set up, uh, alternate light source. I have everything ready there. And it's gonna be a lot easier and probably a lot more effective to do my dusting there in the station at my workstation than it is on a tabletop back at the crime scene. So how do I get my glass, my drinking glass to the station without harming the latent prints that are on there? Well, one way would be to package it in perhaps a cardboard box using packing material to keep the glass from moving. Now, often you can shine your light and see where the fingerprints are on something like a glass. And you can be sure to put your packaging material so that it won't um, damage the glass. And there's ways to suspend things in a box. It can get kind of complicated. Uh, you can you know, cut out other pieces of cardboard and, and fashion it so the glass is, uh, the sides of the glass are not actually touching the inside of the box. Things like that you can do. But these are all things we need to be aware of that can affect um, the appearance of our latents. And that's what we're looking for. The technique used to view or enlarge prints will also influence variations in appearance. So magnification, photographic equipment, computer facsimile or copy machines, and other media used for printing, viewing, copying, and enlarging prints can cause variations. If you take a photograph with a camera and you use the wrong lens, you can have distortion. Uh, so we have to be careful with all of these things as well. So right now, let's take a look at some variations. So we have uh, five uh, latent prints here. Um, some of them appear to have been dusted and at least one is rolled. They may all be inked ones, I'm not sure, but let's look what, they, what we have here. Um, so these variations do not necessarily preclude determination or exclusion of the source print. Rather, we just expect them. Just as pattern formations in nature are unique, the prints made by each independent touching will produce a pattern that is just not like any other, as we can see in this example. So we have a right thumbprint. So these are all of the same digit. They're the right thumbprint of somebody. Uh, a is a typical impression. That's what we might find at a crime scene. B, we have extra pressure uh, exerted, uh, causing a little bit of a color reversal and, and also making it appear to be larger. It, it looks like a larger thumb, doesn't it? Well, that's simply because there was more pressure put and it pressed the skin down, spreads out. So the two of them are the same print, but the second one, there was more pressure. And then C, uh, that's a rolled impression. So the finger, or in this case, the thumb is rolled from uh, nearly one uh, side of your thumbnail to the other. And so you get a lot more, uh, that's the nice thing about rolled prints. Uh, also um, the, the live scan prints that we do, we have a whole lot of area covered. Uh, and D is an impression with some pressure towards the top of the finger and rolled forward to record more of the tip. And I'm gonna talk about that later, but a lot of times like oh, over here, we don't see the tip and uh, there we go. We don't see the tip of the finger, even though this is a rolled impression, um, a lot of time that is information is missing. But this example here includes more of the tip. So it's an impression with some pressure, uh, impression with some pressure toward the top of the finger to record uh, and rolled forward to record more of the tip. I'll talk about tips later. And then E, 
This is an impression with excessive pressure resulting in a poorly recorded print. So we can see that here we have one thumbprint and we have all kinds of variations here and there can be many others. Uh, we haven't even talked about this, this example, even though we talked about it, does not include the substrate issues, whether it's textured surface or a smooth surface, on and on. Well, there's no such thing as a perfect or exact match between two independent prints or recordings from the same source. Each print is unique, yet an examiner can often determine whether unique prints originated from the same unique source. So as you look at these, they are not in the way we, we see them. For instance, the size here, it's different. But as an examiner, you can look at them and say, this is from the same source. All right, next I would like to talk about uh, ridge features and clarity. Clarity can be broken down into three levels. All three levels may be present in different areas in the same impression. So what are these three levels? Well, the first level is first level detail, and that is ridge flow. This is the lowest level of clarity and detail. Overall, the pattern type or ridge flow may be observed. This level of clarity can, contains class characteristics only and alone cannot be individualized or identified, all right? The first level detail of friction ridge features is the general overall direction of ridge flow in the print. First level detail is not limited to a defined classification pattern. Every impression that is determined to be a friction ridge print has a direction, a general direction of ridge flow or this first level detail. The perceived general direction of ridge flow is not to be considered unique. There can be many prints that have the same ridge flow. Uh, the general direction is shared by many other sources. So let's look at three prints here. And what we're looking for is the ridge flow. Now you might say, well, these look out of focus. Um, I really can't tell much. Well, I purposely made these a little out of focus because I want you to be looking at the ridge flow and not any more detail. So we just look and see, is this ridge flow, this is the ridge flow. Uh, do, and, and then I have a known next to it. Is the ridge flow similar? That's the kind of thing we're looking for in first level detail. If you look at it and the ridge flow is not similar, then you move on. That's the first level detail. So if it does have the similar ridge flow, then you move to step two or the second level detail, I should say. And that's the path of individual ridges. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. As you follow the path of individual ridges, you'll observe the location where the ridge ends or breaks into two or bifurcates or just continues through the pattern area. Other major ridge features such as locations of dots or islands, usually containing one pore may also be observed. So level two detail allows us to make further progress in an identification. And we can actually make an identification at level two, though that's not always what we're trying to do. So second level detail is the path of a specific ridge. The actual path, uh, ridge path, includes a starting position of the ridge, the path the ridge takes, the length of the ridge path, and where the ridge stops. Second level detail is much more then the specific location of where a ridge terminates at a ridge ending or bifurcation. Sequences and configurations with other ridge paths are part of second level detail. The ridge path and its length with terminations are unique. 
The sequences and configurations of a series of ridge paths are also unique. Second level detail in a print cannot exist without first level details. So that's where we get first level and then we move to second level. The general direction of ridge flow must exist for a specific ridge path to exist. So let's look at this now. We have first and second level details. So here we have, we can now see that we have a ridge flow, which is our first level. And now we can also see, uh, we're looking more closely, if this now has the same ridge flow as our, whatever we're comparing, if this is the latent and we're comparing against a known print, has the same ridge flow appearance. Now we look at ridges and we look for the second level detail, which is the path of individual ridges. And we say, okay, I've got this path here and does it match on my other, whichever I'm uh, comparing to. And we look for ridge endings, bifurcations, and that will help us to now further narrow it down. If we can't find those similarities, then it's not going to be um, the same print. But if we find those similarities, now we can move on to our third level. The third level detail is ridge appearance. This is the highest level of clarity and therefore the greatest individualization or individualizing power is possible with the smallest features and area. Third level details are the shapes of ridge structures. This level allows the observation of the features present on the individual ridge. So scars, shapes, contours, pore structure, ridge alignment or misalignment, those things can be visualized, analyzed, compared, and evaluated. So just so I'm not, I, I'm, I don't want to confuse anybody, let me go back to the second level. Here, we can make an identification. We can say this is the same print based on these paths, these points that I've picked out. We're going to get to that in a moment. But then for third level, which really is the icing on the cake, what we want to do is get the ridge appearance, which can even be the pores. And so now we're getting down to more detail. And so we look at the individual ridges and compare those. And we'll get into this when we get into the comparison process. Uh, but those are the three levels. And you hear first, second, and third level detail often. And in fact, when we get to the end of the night, I'm going to be talking about uh, how we document our findings, our work. And you'll see where we actually put down first level, second level, third level. Um, it depends on your department, but we'll get to that later. All right. So that is ridge features and clarity. Next, let's look at the actual identification process. And I know I touched on this before, but now we're doing the comparison process. So this is where this is uh, most important. And that is ACE-V. So friction skin identification is done with scientific methodology. And back in 1959, um, there was a, a fellow with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Roy Huber, and he proposed that individualization is a three-stage process and that those three stages were analysis, comparison, and evaluation. Well, that's the three-step. Well, somewhere along the line, it became very important and, and recognized that we also needed the V, which is verification. The first part of ACE-V is analysis. The print being compared is examined to determine what detail or features are present. Uh, the ridge flow, 
flex, uh, uh, flex creases, pattern type, grouping of features. Also the clarity uh, of the detail and the area of friction skin that made the impression, all that may be determined. The examiner makes a determination based on previous training, experience, understanding and judgment, whether the print is sufficient for comparison with another print. If one of the prints is determined to be insufficient, the examination is concluded with a determination that the print is insufficient for comparison purposes. So the analysis is the first step, and that's where you look at the print and say, do I have enough detail here to make a comparison? That's the first, your analysis. Then the C in ACE V is comparison. So the direct or side-by-side -side comparison of friction ridge details to determine whether the details in two prints are in agreement based on similarity, sequence, and spatial relationship occurs in the comparison phase. The evidence print is compared to a known exemplar. The prints are placed side by side, orienting the evidence print to the area in the exemplar that it should, could correspond. A prominent area or grouping of features pre present in the evidence print is located and the exemplar is searched for the same grouping of features. That's just kind of a summary of what we do with the comparison. Then E is evaluation. The comparison is evaluated to determine if the features agree or if they are dissimilar. An identification is made based on the agreement of detail or similarities, or, the, or an elimination is made based on dissimilarity. In the event there is insufficient detail or the detail is of insufficient quality, it may not be possible to identify or eliminate. During the examination, the examiner cannot determine if two prints are originated from the same source with agreement of only first level details. But here's the first level details. And then uh, if the examiner determines sufficient agreement of the first and second levels or first, second and third levels of detail after the analysis and comparison and evaluation of um, individualization is made. You say this is a, we don't want to say match, identification, or um, individualization. All right, so we have, here are two latents. We have first level detail, which is ridge flow. We have second level detail, which is the path of individual ridges. And then our third level detail is ridge appearance. Let's look at a few examples. So here we have first level details with two prints and we can see that the, they're not in agreement for ridge flow. This one, we have this wave, this one much straighter. So right away, we don't have to go any further. We know that these two are not going to be uh, matched. Second level details, not in agreement. This is where you start looking at the terminations of these ridges, the lengths of the ridges, bifurcations, dots, islands. Again, this is where you could make an identification, uh, but we would like to go on to the third level if at all possible. And we can see here that these do not, uh, do not pass that Test, they are not in agreement. I don't want to say don't match. I'll just say not in agreement. So if we had the ridge flow, which you can see here, first detail, and now we go to the second detail and we get to this point, we're going to stop because this is not, uh, these are not in agreement. And then the third level is ridge appearance. So now we're gonna start looking at the ridges themselves and see if all these 
features. Here's a notch. It looks like a notch. Well, that's really a pore on the edge of the ridge. And we start looking at all the detail and we can see that, no, these don't uh, agree. Now, if you, let me tell you this. If you are successful at level two, that is the path of individual ridges, where you're actually seeing that they are the, are what appears to be identical, then the third level is going to be pretty simple. Depending on what we already talked about, the clarity issue, your evidence print and your um, known print, if they are, if there's a problem with the appearance, as an example, if the latent print you lifted is a little smudged or you used it a little too much powder, well, when you look at the known print, you may not find a lot of this because with too much powder, you tend to fill in those pores. Same thing with ink. If the fingerprint was rolled on a card and there was too much ink, that can fill in the pores. It can even fill in space between the ridges, the, the uh, valley areas, uh, furrows, we call them. So again, all this stuff varies but we know the kind of thing we're looking at. Now, let's get another example here. This is going to show uh, some fingerprints here at the top. Now I know it's hard to see on your screens, so I'll talk you through it. You'll have to take my word for some of this because it is hard to see, but uh, it's pretty amazing. So A, B, C, D, these are four digits that appear to have been placed at one time. That's where they appear to be. And now we have A, B, C, D, little letters that are of uh, our known, our, our suspect, okay? Uh, and this could be the fingertips from the 10 print card. Uh, you remember that down in the bottom, right and left, there are spaces to put simultaneous prints. Anyway, so we have these as our known. Uh, now, most people would look, and, and here's an enlargement of A, B, C, and D. Most people would look at this and say, I don't have anything. There's not enough here. But you know what? There is. <laughs> We're going to see that there is enough here to make an identification. Uh, and that's why it really bothers me when CSIs or police officers or whoever is dusting for prints and they find something like these four at the top and they say, well, this is no good and they don't lift it or they lift it and they say, well, this is no good and then they discard it. Well, lift it, you know, let the examiner determine if there's anything there. The examiner is used to getting a whole lot of prints that don't look good because that's how most of them are anyway. You know, if we could teach the bad guys to lightly touch and maybe even rub their foreheads to get a little oil on their fingertip and then only touch, you know, uh, non-porous surfaces like glass. If we could teach them to do that, then we would make all kinds of identifications. And if I were given these four up here on a card, at first glance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think, well, oh, this is going to be tough. But then as I look at this under a, a, magnifier's gl a magnifying glass, uh, an examiner's glass, I'm going to say, ah, oh, look at that. We got some ridge detail. I can see some ridges that, where they stop and start. I can see a bifurcation. I can see pores. And then I'm going to go ahead and look at those prints carefully because that's part of the analysis process, right? On the ACE-V analysis, I'm gonna look at these and say, yeah, I, I think I have enough here, enough to give it a shot. All right, and that comes with experience and training. All right, now what we're looking at here, uh, we have the latents uh, marked with the capital letters and the known prints with small letters to uh, correspond. 
The first and third columns are unannotated. Uh, and then the second and the fourth columns have colored markings to show the corresponding ridge flow and details. So we look here and these are the ridge flow and details that match over here. Likewise with B, we have these ridge flows and details that we can find. And you can use different colors. Uh, that's, that's helpful if you, if you do this, if you mark up like this, uh, and you will do this uh, often on a copy um, of the print. And you know, if you've got uh, a dot or an island, uh, here we have quite a bit on this one. And there we go, and so forth. So a um, couple of things here. Uh, we're talking about the uh, ACV process. This is the comparison part. And it's also to show that you don't need a whole lot. You can get really nice results with a very small, it, it takes a little more work, obviously. Then we get to verification. Verification is the independent examination by another qualified examiner resulting in the same conclusion. Verification is required for all individualizations or identifications. Verification is optional for exclusion or inconclusive determinations. So if you say, I've identified this print, it must be verified. If, however, you say, this is not it, then normally you don't go to verification for that because you've already determined that's not it. That's good enough. Inconclusive as well. You say, well, I just don't have enough here. Now you could go to verification on either of those as well, especially on inconclusive. It might be a good time to say, you know, I, I've got this ridge flow and, you know, there's a little bit of ridge detail here that's, that looks similar. Would you look at this for me? Tell me if I'm missing anything. Um, but verification normally is done uh, with those that you've identified. All right. And it has to be agreed on. What happens if the verifier disagrees? Well, then one of you is wrong. So you have to work from there. So, some places they go to a, a second verifier or you discuss back and forth your reasoning. And usually then one person's going to either agree or disagree. But if you don't both agree, then um, you're done. You're not going to say that's identification. Just have to have that verification. All right, so back to the comparison process. Okay, so the evidence print is compared to known prints using level one detail. Now that's the ridge flow, remember? Two of the known prints are eliminated. Right, so this is our latent print, and we wanna compare it to these knowns over here, these four. Well, we're looking for ridge flow. So we have this kind of flow. I mean, right away, you can tell that's a whirl, right? And that's a whirl with an inner tracing. Look at that. It goes right in there. Here's the second delta, one delta, two deltas. We trace that, and it's at least uh, three ridges in, so it's an inner. Well, we look at this first one, and just we don't even have to look for that inner tracing, but it's okay. That is okay. That could be uh, level one detail, yes. And then here, is this the same ridge flow? No, we have the ridge flow going this way. How about, and so that's an arch, right? And then we have here a loop. So a lot of the ridge flow is the pattern itself. What is, what is it a, uh, an arch, tented arch, that kind of thing. Now we look at this one and this has a similar ridge flow. So these two 
are what we're going to proceed to look at for our comparison. These two, we just eliminate. So that's pretty simple. Then a target group of features is identified and compared to the remaining known prints. And in this case, in our example, we're going to end up being able to eliminate one. All right. So we now are looking for more detail. And we look here and we say, are these similar? Not at all. Because these two are not similar in this target area, we're just going to eliminate this one over here. So now we're down to one. And then the third, a possible target group is located in the remaining known print and a detailed comparison is done examining level two and level three features. So now we get down to more detail and we see over here, well, let's look at the little enlargement. That'll be easier for us to see on our screens. We have this curvature of a ridge here, or it could be an extreme bifurcation, whichever you might call that. Uh, we have ridge detail that comes up this way. And even this larger spot right here, there's a pore right there. We have a large spot right there. We have a bifurcation here, with these two ridges. And one ridge ends, the lower ridge ends. So here, what I would say is, we have an identification. Now, yeah, you'd go through here and you'd find even more uh, points. We'll talk about that as well. But this is how we get down to uh, make an, ident uh, an individualization or identification. Uh, then fourth, the comparison and evaluation is expanded. All the features are in agreement and identification is made. Okay, so I kind of got ahead of myself there. Now we look at the rest of the print. That's what I was already saying. And now we look for other features and now we have many points. So here we have a point, here's a point. You know, this, these two right here, if you didn't get 20 or 30 points out of this, uh, you're just not looking. There's a lot there in agreement. When it comes to comparisons, we then have our conclusions to make. Of course, once we have made an identification, we do the verification process, the ACEV. But as far as our conclusions go, there are three conclusions a latent print examiner can arrive at when making a comparison between two prints. All right. One is identification. The two prints are one and the same. So the examiner has established by a comparison of the features present in the two impressions that they came from the same source, a specific person and a specific area of friction skin. This is a conclusive examination. Then the second is elimination. Let me say that again. Uh, the two prints are not the same. The examiner has established by comparison that the features are different and were not made by the person whose exemplar is being compared. This is also a conclusive examination. You've come to a conclusion on both. Then the third possible uh, result is inconclusive meaning the examiner cannot identify or eliminate the print. An inconclusive comparison results when there is insufficient detail needed for identification or elimination in the evidence print and or in the exemplar. Now remember, since every area of friction skin is unique and therefore can come from only one donor, it's not an accepted practice to give possible or probable opinions as to an identification. These are the three things you can say about it and no more. There's currently no scientifically proven way to establish a probable identification by statistics 
or any other way in the area of friction skin identification. Once again, if it were the examiner's conclusion that there is insufficient detail to determine that the two prints are one and the same, and the examiner is unable to eliminate the evidence print, it would be appropriate to report the findings as inconclusive. Don't let anybody try to get you to say, well, what's the probability? That doesn't compute. No, if so, and if some, if some expert witness gets up and says, well, there's an 80% chance that this is the right print, they're just totally wrong. You know, it's either identification, elimination, or inconclusive. That's all we can come up with. 